What's up, guys? Welcome to the final drive presented by Microsoft Surface. We're going to recap the season, uh, recap some of Tom Telesco's presser. Haley, um, listen, we, we, we did this every Sunday or Monday. Uh, it wasn't the, the results I think everybody was seeking, seven and nine, a good way to close the year, uh, new beginnings in 2021. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that is a bright spot, a little spot of optimism. Look, we talk about it all the time. You never know if momentum can carry over. And obviously, there are changes that are now happening with this team, with the dismissal of Anthony Lynn. But Tom Telesco even mentioned it in his press conference, which I know we'll get to. But the fact that they won those final four games at the end, three in division, is I think all something. it's something that all these players can hang their hat on and be like, hey, we didn't fold. They suffered the worst loss in franchise history to the Patriots, and they kept going. And not only did they keep going, but they won in ways that they hadn't found to win in previously this season. So I think that ultimately, even though – like, as we said, momentum may not carry over. There is something to be said about finishing strong and being able to go, hey, we can win that way. We can win on final drives. We can make those kicks and, and do everything like that. And I think that's a bright spot and something that this team will take into the offseason, a very unknown offseason at this point, but, yeah. but a good one in that sense. I'll say this about Coach Lynn the last four years. His teams fought for him, man. You know, yeah. that first year to start 0 and 4, to end 9 and 7, to go 12 and 4. Uh, you know, a 5 and 11 year uh, was, was difficult in, in 2019. And, and then, you know, to have four straight wins to, to close out the season, uh, a lot of hope with the rookie quarterback and, and Justin Herbert. So the future is bright. And Tom mentioned his press conference the organization going to uh, chart a, a new path. And, uh, and see if, if this roster can kind of get over the hump. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where you look at the roster, Haley, and, and, and Tom even mentioned this in his press conference, the, the amount of injuries uh, compared to some other teams uh, wasn't as bad in, in 2020. Mm -hmm. But when you do lose guys like Mike Pouncey and Derwin James and, and Drew Tranquil and the amount of injuries in season, whether it was Chris Harris Jr. or Austin Eckler or Melvin Ingram, uh, when it happens to marquee guys, unfortunately, it, it, the results are going to show in that. And it's, it's funny because everybody says injuries are not an excuse. I realize that. But sometimes yeah. you have to look at it and be like, you know what? It probably would have been a little bit different had uh, two or three of the guys that we were really counting on been in those games, at least for uh, a portion of the season. Yeah, probably. And I think that's one of the things that that I really took away from Tom's presser was how candid he was about that and, and how candid he was about saying, look, you know, everyone's talking about injuries, but we weren't that injured. I think he said this team was in the bottom third of the league in terms of actual totality, that total number of injuries. But like you said, it just happened to marquee guys. And when you find out during, you know, towards the beginning of the season or whenever it was, because what is time at this point that, you know, Mike Pouncey isn't going to be able to play and Dan Feeney has to come in and play center and, and do a serviceable job and, and other guys get hurt throughout the year. It's tough. And it's especially tough too when you look at an offense that had its own injury incident and then had to basically start anew with with the guy that they thought was going to be sitting this year and, and learning and watching and growing from from afar but I think what they were able to do and again you know citing just the end of the season and those four games which which I remember I actually spoke with who was it I forget it was either Nasir Adderley or Chris Harris Jr. yesterday and they said look if we had to suit up this week we're not sure who would be out there because they were getting thin towards the end yeah. of the year but to be able to put wins together with the guys that they did, not even having, you know, the offense was a shell of essentially what it, you know, normally should be and should look like. I think that's that's really hopeful. And and it shows you that that some of those younger guys, those depth pieces were able to rise to the occasion. And look, this team's only going to get better ultimately because you're going to have guys who are coming back next year who are fully healthy, knock on wood. You know, Derwin James is able to ride into the 2021 season fully healthy, ready to go. And and that'll be huge. That's a, that's a huge point. I mean, Tom even talked about him just from a leadership standpoint, too, of, of missing that. And I think he's an interesting one to me because he's such a young guy still on this oh, yeah. roster. I mean, they, they have even a guy like Joey Bosa is is age 25. Wise, still so young, 20 like babies. I wish I was 25 again. But um. <laughs> 
but, but being able to, to have some of these guys, I think that's actually one thing for me. And I'm going to segue this answer a little bit is you saw to me, I saw some guys take a step in that leadership role this year. And I, I cite guys like Joey and guys like Hunter, who obviously were draft mates in 2016. And like I said, age-wise still very young, but to me, they took that kind of step forward from that maturity leadership standpoint. And I just think again, when you have health back and you have a year, obviously the system, you know, there will be changes there. We're not so sure, but, but being able to then gel with Justin, go into a new season, knowing that Justin Herbert is your quarterback and building off of that, it'll be good. Uh, You know, another guy that kind of stepped up into that leadership role at the end of the season, uh, and he was a leader really all through his his college career at Oklahoma. But Kenneth Murray, yeah. you know, he's breaking down the team, you know, at, at Arrowhead. And Patrick Mahomes isn't playing, and Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey they're not playing. But the act of winning at Arrowhead, you know, and, and having guys that are going to be here for a long time, go through the act of winning a football game in Kansas City. I think is a big mm-hmm. deal. And I think it's a big deal for Justin Herbert, for Kenneth Murray, uh, a, a lot of guys who got the opportunity to play there and, and maybe win there for the first time to, to close the year with three straight wins in the division. Just having the confidence that Justin Herbert is the guy. Like yeah. to hear veterans speak about Justin, uh, I think it was, it was Denzel after the game said, Herb is not a rookie man, he is on a different level. And that's how they think of him. And I just, I think that's really cool. And I I don't know if they would have said that in the middle of the year, even with all the Mm -hmm. the big uh, numbers, the act of winning and winning all four games to to close the year, that's when you earn the respect of everybody in the locker room. And, And Justin certainly has that. He certainly has that. And I'm going to say one other thing too about Kenneth Murray, because I was talking to Chris Harris Jr. and asked him, or he actually mentioned a lot of the younger guys on the defense come to him and ask him questions. And I I asked him, you know, as a veteran player at this point in his career, over a decade of experience, is that encouraging to see that? And he said, yeah. And he goes, look, I used to do it all the time in Denver when I had Champ Bailey and Brian Dawkins back there, I was picking their brain. And he said, one of the guys who was constantly in his ear this year was Kenneth Murray. Cause he goes, look, I play back and we were kind of back together and he was always coming to me and asking me questions. And I was giving him advice and he cited him too, as a guy who really took a leap towards that back end of the year, that back half. So I think when you, you have guys like that who aren't afraid to ask questions, aren't afraid to pick the brains of some of these older guys on the team. It's only going to benefit them. And it's so encouraging. And, and players even agree that it's encouraging when that actually does happen. So Tom spoke at great length uh, on Wednesday, about 40, 45 minutes or so. And uh, it, went, it went through a variety of topics from uh, the coaching search to what the, the organization is looking for in a coach and a leader always comes up because you yeah. want to be that, that tone setter, that, that culture uh, changer. And really, I think that's what Coach Lim did a great job of it, kind of changing the culture and, and, and people buying in and, and people fighting to the end. So you want to have a, a guy who, who's going to come in and, and bring that to the Chargers. Um, these next two weeks, I, I think, are going to be interesting. I think fans are excited about, OK, what is the organization going to look like in a couple of weeks? Um, Tom didn't want to give too much away, uh, but mm-hmm. it, it seems like they're going to cast a pretty wide net and and do their due diligence to find the right guy. Yeah, it sounds like they're going to cast a wide net. They're going to interview candidates of different position backgrounds and and make sure that they have you know whatever it is that they specialize in. There's a plan for the other two sides of the ball in that sense. And and I think the leadership point was really interesting to me because he talked about how when you come into an NFL locker room as a head coach, you are leading a wide demographic of ages. You are leading guys who are fresh out of college, maybe would technically be like junior age in college going into their senior years. And then you're leading veterans who are older than you and me on this call. And so I think it's interesting sometimes where you have to find that person who's that balance of both. And the other interesting thing, because you and I also both talked to him is we're still in this age of, we're still doing this on Zoom. We're still in these unprecedented times, even though it's 2021. And so a lot of these interviews are currently being done virtually, but he said it actually seems to be a benefit because it allows you to really 
interview a wider array of candidates when you don't have to worry about travel, when you don't have to factor in the time spent going to and from one place. And I think that's an interesting point because look, there is something to be said, and Tom did say this about being able to have the face-to-face -face interaction and all of that. And he said, we'll get to that point when we start narrowing down but to start wide and to be able to have almost that luxury of being able to log on and, and go through your it's questions, huge. huge. And and a huge benefit is, you know, one of the things that came out of the crazy year that was 2020, that, that that'll be interesting to see how I think it's six total teams are looking for head coaches and, and how that plays into everyone's decision and, and decision-making process. It's helped us with our jobs this year. I mean, yeah. just by, <laughs> by doing podcasts or interviews, the, the fact yeah. that you can just give somebody a link and they can pop on and you can do a, a 15 minute interview as opposed yeah. to trying a range of place to meet and, and go through different channels and stuff. Boom, here's the link. Go. And, yeah. and it, it's interesting because that's going to be something that I think it, you, you look at what may carry over from, you know, the, the time of dealing of uh, trying to work during a pandemic. Um, I, I think yeah. just the zoom and, and the technology, uh, That'll be used, I think, probably in, in, in the football operations, uh, th that standpoint, but, but really just in general, just this is how we're going to communicate with people. And I think during a head coaching mm -hmm. search, I mean, how easy is it to just say, hey, all right, schedule a two hour interview via Zoom. I'll yep. be ready. Here's the link. Boom. Yep. Here's the link. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy when you, it's crazy when you think about that. And, and I just thought it was an interesting and sort of insightful answer to be like, Hey, this is a positive, you know, cause it's, it's nothing that they've ever really dealt with before. Or obviously I think you probably could have done it before, but I think like any of us, zoom was always there. It was always, I think it was preloaded on all of our computers. We just didn't really know it existed. We just didn't really know it. <laughs> no. I'll say this it's full, it's full usage capacity until this year where all of a sudden we're dealing with a draft a virtual draft and I'm going, okay, well, instead of maybe calling Dan Fouts, I'll shoot him a zoom link and Dan Fouts knows how to use zoom now. So it's interesting. And it's a, I am in full agreement with you where I think it's going to be something that, that will stick around in, in different capacities, even as we move forward to knock on wood, a very more normal sort of a environment here. And that's what we're all hoping to eventually get to where fans are at training camp, fans are at the games, we can interact yeah. with people, we can see people in person. You know, normally we would be in person with Tom, we'd see him all the time in yep. the office, and that just hasn't been the case this year. So uh, any of the takeaways from, from Tom's presser? Um, again, we, we have an interview with Tom that, that's going to be released a little bit later um, with, with some different questions and answers from the press. A few things overlap, but anything that, that stood out to you, Haley? Yeah, I'm kind of going through my notes right now. I mean, I think one of the things that he said, uh, one actually really funny thing, an anecdote that he mentioned was how, and it kind of plays into what we just said, was he had never met Pep Hamilton in face until training camp, until literally they're like getting tested and, and it's training camp. And that's just, you know, a, a uh, byproduct of what happened this year. And that was sort of just a funny kind of nugget that he had in his presser. I think, um, you know, I think one of the things too is the outlook that he has for this 2021 team is very, very positive. And he said, look, 2020 was full of peaks and valleys. And sometimes those valleys got a little too low, mm -hmm. but he did say he believes that this team has an opportunity to ascend and ascend quickly with the pieces that they have. Also, this is going to be a very interesting year with the salary cap possibly going down, probably going down with whatever is, you know, was collectively bargained and, and agreed upon with COVID and, and all of that. Um, and he said, by no means do we have a perfect roster, but there is a bright future and there is a great future and a great time. You know, this is a really good time to have a lot of younger pieces on your team as well and also add some younger pieces as well in this draft. So I think just his overall sort of, positive opportunistic outlook to this team moving forward that, Hey, seven and nine, obviously wasn't what they wanted. They did rattle off four wins at the end, but there is an opportunity to ascend when you get the right coaching staff in here and you make all the necessary roster adjustments and, and changes and things that need to happen that he feels good about where this team is and where they can go moving forward. And we talked to Tom about a variety of different topics from Justin to undrafted free agents, that process, guys like uh, Guyton and, and Tyron mm -hmm. Johnson, 
to the, the head coaching search. So uh, a, a lot of good stuff in the, the final, final drive that will uh, yeah. we'll drop later <laughs> on this week. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Chargers Weekly will resume next Thursday. We, we got a couple of special final drives for you this week. Um, the, the Epic in Miami, if you haven't seen the, the roll call, Haley, I'll let you talk about that because uh, that was – obviously one of the, the best games in NFL history and it was the anniversary and you, you got to do something pretty special. Yeah. We got a bunch of guys together from the Epic in Miami, a bunch of former chargers players. And, and it was cool because we've never done that. We've never really gotten, Hey, we're going to talk about this specific game and we're going to get a bunch of guys from that game together. And the 39th anniversary was January 2nd. So we put out the roll call on it. I think we're going to do a podcast on it. Hopefully maybe piece in a little bit more of the full version because the video is only 15 minutes. I believe we all were together for over an hour. So kudos. to And the, the best stuff for- is always on the cutting, <laughs> room, on floor. The cutting room floor. <laughs> well, it's really funny because look, they hit on a bunch of different topics, including just, you know, the weather, the heat, Miami making a quarterback change, them being down or excuse me, being up 24, nothing and Miami coming back after that QB change. And obviously the kicks over time, but there are other things that we talked about in the, uh, the full version, including the impact of, of Kellen Winslow and him blocking the kick at the end to send the game to overtime to, you know, that iconic image. I think when people think of the Epic in Miami, they think of that image of Kellen Winslow being carried off the field and, and just Fouts talking about he was done towards the end of the game. And, and he said this, I think in the final version of the video that we had nobody like Rolf Benershka had to make that second kick in overtime because he goes, we were done. We were depleted and done. But it's funny, someone on Twitter had had uh, replied to the video or, or a tweet that I had put out about it and said, it's it's funny when you, you know, these are the stories that come out 10 to 15 years later. And I'm like, try 39, you yeah. know? <laughs> How about four <laughs> decades? Is, about almost four decades. The four decades later, you get these stories, but it was cool. And I'll say one more thing about it. Dan Fouts towards the end was asked or we were just kind of talking and and he said you know he gets approached by various fans nfl fans not even just chargers fans but nfl fans all the time and go man i wish you guys won a super bowl you were such a stacked team and and i'm just so bummed it didn't happen and fouts said yeah you know me too but who won super bowl 12 who won super bowl 24 and he's like they can never answer but if i say Hey, do you remember watching the Epic in Miami? He goes, Oh, the, I'll get the reaction like that, man. That was such a great game. That was so cool. So, people know. you know, look that, that, yeah, people know that, that those Chargers teams, they might not have, uh, they might not have won the, the whole enchilada as we like to say, but that is certainly an Epic game. And, and the irony too, is they went from playing one game, the Epic in Miami, which earned a nickname to the freezer bowl the very next week. So to, it's just crazy to be part of a sort of NFL lore like that, but it was a lot of fun, really cool experience. Check it out on YouTube and hopefully we can get a, a little bit of a more unedited audio version up very soon. Yeah. I was going to say it's, it's a must watch, but it will also eventually be a must listen yeah. once you, once you get all the, uh, all the good stuff in there as well. So uh, a couple more things. Uh, opponents for this upcoming season, 2021 Mm -hmm. Broncos, Chiefs, Raiders, we know Uh, Browns coming to SoFi stadium, Steelers coming to SoFi stadium. Those teams play each other on Sunday, Cowboys, Giants, Patriots. So Mm -hmm. NFC East this year on the road, Broncos, Chiefs, Raiders, Bengals, Ravens, Philly, the Washington football team and the Texans. So, Opponents are set it, when, when you're thinking about SoFi Stadium in 2021. And I mean, that's a lot of big games, Haley, coming to L.A. this year when we talk about the, the Cowboys, the Giants, the Steelers, the Browns, a pretty good slate. It's a really exciting slate and a lot of really fun teams, too, especially when you think of, you know, the Steelers coming in and the Browns for what they were able to do. And, you know, they're still obviously still in playoff contention at this point. So that's a really fun, exciting slate. And that's another thing Tom talked about is hopefully we are in a good place in the late summer and fall for fans to be out at training camp for fans to be in SoFi stadium. It is an experience. That place is an experience unlike any other. And it'll be so much fun when, I mean, we've talked about it all season long, but, but when fans are truly in there getting it rocking 
getting it going. It's going to be yeah. a really awesome time. And, and now that we know officially who's coming to town, it's going to be fun. A little extra fun. Draft two chargers will select 13th overall. So, you know, over the next few months with the senior bowl and the combine mm-hmm. and pro days, uh, we don't know what they're going to look like yet, but we do know yeah. that the draft evaluation process starts here very shortly into April. So it's always an exciting time um, <clears throat> during the draft. It's one of my favorite times of the year. And, you know, when you have a top 15 pick, uh, chances are you're, you're going to get a starter uh, that c- can hopefully make an impact uh, on the roster. And, and you think of the guys you hit on in the first round last year, Justin Herbert, Kenneth Murray, if you can get a, a, a talent, Similar to that, you're in good shape. Yeah, and Tom said this team is probably slated to have nine picks this year at some point. Obviously, a couple of positions still to be decided, but but really good shape. And, and that's exciting too. And I think it just sort of plays in again to kind of what he said that he talked about just the excitement of being able to build a team and, and sort of start from scratch. And I think that's almost, I think, how everyone's approaching 2021 because 2020 was tough and, and challenging for a lot of different reasons and a lot of different ways. And if you walked out of that year with your health, I mean, I, I think we are very, very lucky and fortunate in that sense. But to be able to start from scratch and, and start over and, and almost like we've kind of talked about getting a, almost a reopening redo at SoFi Stadium with, with the eventual um, fans who will be there, it'll just be a lot of fun. And, and there's so much hope and optimism. And It'll be exciting too to see what this team does over these next few weeks with in terms of their head coaching search and, and what kind of transpires from there. And then, like Tom said, from there building the coaching staff and the player evaluations and everything that goes into it. And look, all of a sudden it's draft time because it flies by. <laughs> it's amazing. Like when you see Herbert and the way he finished the year and, and some of these guys flying around, you're you want this. 2021 season to start as soon as possible. So yeah, um, th- there's a lot to look forward to. We appreciate you guys hanging with us all season long after these games. Appreciate you guys joining us and we'll see you throughout the, the off season. We have some fun stuff cooked up.